on World News Tonight. Unexpected arrival. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif returns home amidst impending arrest. Days of rage. Joe Biden visits Israel following deadly Gaza hospital blast. Dairy strikes. Australian dairy workers drive a 48-hour strike into action, demanding better wages. And checkerboard reigns. Iconic checkerboard patterns dominate Versace's catwalk at Milan Fashion Week. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight in Pakistan as the country's former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif sought protection from arrest from a court in Islamabad ahead of his planned return to the country. Sharif, who lived in voluntary exile in London until this month, is expected to return to Pakistan. He is currently a fugitive from justice, having failed to appear before a court in 2019. He stepped down in 2017 after a court convicted him of corruption. Two years later, facing further corruption charges, he complained of chest pains and was granted permission by his successor, Imran Khan, to travel to London for medical treatment. Once in London, Sharif prolonged his stay, saying his doctors were not allowing him to travel. He has been wanted by Pakistani authorities since 2020, when a court issued a warrant for his arrest after the failed to return home from London. Sharif is now expected to end nearly four years of self-imposed exile, most of which he spent in London. If he fails to get protection from arrest from the Islamabad High Court, Sharif will be detained upon his return. But if he is granted bail, he will address a rally in the eastern city of Lahore prior to appearing before the court in Islamabad to surrender. Israel-Hamas conflict updates now. U.S. President Joe Biden visited Tel Aviv to show solidarity with Israel. The visit comes after the deadly hospital bombing in Gaza, which the president says appears to have been done by an Islamic terror group, backing Israel's claims that it's not behind the blast. Meanwhile, upon Biden's request, Israel will allow aid into Gaza through the border with Egypt. Following talks between U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday, the prime minister's office announced it would not prevent aid from entering Gaza through its border with Egypt. The office stressed that relief should only reach civilians in Gaza, adding food, water and medicine will be the only supplies allowed through. It also said it would maintain a blockade of humanitarian aid from Israel into Gaza until hostages being held by Hamas are released. Egypt announced on Thursday that it would allow sustainable passage for aid to cross through its border with Gaza, as hundreds of aid trucks have been waiting to go through. And despite a U.S. veto of a U.N. resolution condemning all violence against civilians in the war between Israel and Hamas, and urging humanitarian aid for Gaza, Biden followed up talks with Netanyahu with a pledge to support both Israel and Gaza. He said he is considering a supplementary request to Congress for some 100 billion U.S. dollars for defense assistance, with some of those funds to be used for Israel. And he also said he would send around 100 million dollars in humanitarian aid to Gaza. Regarding the deadly explosion at the Ali Arab Hospital in Gaza on Tuesday, Biden said that it appears Israel was not responsible for the blast. According to a National Security Council spokesperson, the assessment that another Palestinian militant group caused the explosion was made based on data including intelligence, missile activity and open source video and images of the incident. Meanwhile, also on Wednesday, the U.S. Treasury Department announced sanctions against nine individuals and one entity in places including Gaza, Sudan and Qatar over suspicions they have links to Hamas. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen noted, the United States is taking swift and decisive action to target Hamas's financiers and facilitators following its brutal and unconscionable massacre of Israeli civilians, including children. And in the meantime, the cross-border confrontation between Israeli forces and Hamas militants and its callous consequences are fueling public protests in neighboring countries as well as hate crimes and threats of terrorism in Western Europe. And the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak also arrived in Israel where he's expected to press for humanitarian aid to be delivered to Gaza. Following the deadly blast on Tuesday night on a hospital in the Gaza Strip that killed nearly 500 people, a former Hamas leader called for a worldwide day of rage. 
and thousands of people have rallied in countries across the Middle East and North Africa to protest. On Wednesday, demonstrators gathered outside U.S. embassies. As the Jordanian government declared three days of mourning, thousands of people gathered outside the U.S. and Israeli embassies, where Islamic parties in the country called for a general strike. In the Lebanese capital, Beirut, protesters clashed with security forces who used water cannons to disperse crowds close to the U.S. embassy. Overnight, demonstrations also took place in Turkey, Morocco, Libya and Iran. Meanwhile, the conflict between Israel and Hamas is causing reverberations throughout Europe, from demonstrations to hate crimes and terrorist attacks. Early on Wednesday morning, two hooded men threw Molotov cocktails at a synagogue and a Jewish community center in central Berlin. Local police said there were no reports of injuries or damage. I said this night they were, they were trying to, uh, to burn the building. There were two Molotov cocktails thrown on the building at around 4 o'clock in the, in the morning. So things got, nothing happened. They, they, the bottles apparently didn't reach the building. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who is currently in Egypt after visiting Israel on Tuesday, condemned the attacks and said anti-Semitism has no place in Germany. It is completely clear that we do not accept this and will never accept it when Jewish institutions are attacked and that events and activities which turn violent or use anti-Semitic slogans will not be accepted. Meanwhile, in France, several airports were evacuated on Wednesday after receiving emails containing threats of attack. And following Monday's deaths of two Swedish citizens in a stabbing in Brussels, the leaders of Belgium and Sweden met on Wednesday with the EU's chief executive to discuss the security gap in the bloc's management of migration and asylum. The attack in Brussels was allegedly carried out by a Tunisian national who was in the country illegally after an asylum application was rejected in 2020. One specific dimension relates to individuals who are considered a security threat and have received a return order. Currently, they can be asked to leave voluntarily. We must urgently change this. Von der Leyen said the bloc's next migration pact would help avoid such situations by allowing state authorities to more quickly deport foreigners who are deemed a threat to national security. In his remarks at the Belt and Road Initiative Forum in China, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed stated that Africa is now realizing its potential and capacity, highlighting the rising significance of the formerly sidelined continent. Africa is realizing its potential and becoming an economic, political and social powerhouse, Ethiopia's Prime Minister said on Wednesday. Abiy Ahmed was speaking at the Belt and Road Initiative Summit in Beijing, where he said the formerly sidelined continent was harnessing its demographic dividend and natural resources. He added that Africa has particularly suffered the consequences of the climate crisis and conflicts in other parts of the world, and that we cannot be idle observers in forums that affect common well-being. Representatives from more than 130 countries, largely in the Global South, are attending the summit. Opening the ceremony, China's Xi Jinping lauded the BRI project, which was launched 10 years ago, with a vision of building global infrastructure and energy networks connecting Asia with Africa and Europe. He also pushed against Western efforts to reduce dependence on the Chinese economy. A better world leads to a better China. And a better China contributes to a better world. Through the Belt and Road Initiative, China's doors of openness to the outside world are opening wider. Western leaders insist that their goal is to de-risk, not decouple, from China. They argue that they want to diversify supply chains that have become overly dependent on the world's second largest economy. Analysts say Western skepticism over Xi's plans stems from suspicions over the way it would extend Chinese influence. They've also alleged that China's infrastructure lending has saddled some poorer countries with loans they can't repay. China has at times bristled at criticism of its initiative, saying it carries anti-Chinese prejudice. And now moving on to the latest on the road to the White House. 
Donald Trump was seen appearing in a New York courtroom again, but he had to duck out early for a disposition in different legal matters again as well. Trump's firehose and civil and criminal encumbrances is beginning to keep him off the campaign trail, and he wants everybody to know it, reinforcing the degree to which his legal travails and his political strategy are intersecting. While bouncing between his in-person court appearances, Trump was also reaching to perhaps the most consequential matter of all, the details of a federal judge's gag order that will likely shadow him deep into 2024. Trump isn't obligated to attend his civil proceedings, but he's appeared sporadically at the New York trial, using his presence to underscore the squeeze that his legal entanglements have put him on his already jammed political schedule. Trump is now entering this new phase of his public life, one that will be marked by mad dashes between campaign cattle calls and courtrooms. He has six trials scheduled between now and May, with a few breaks between cases. His civil fraud trial, for example, is expected to continue through December 22nd. And his next trial in a defamation lawsuit brought by the writer E. Jean Carroll is scheduled to begin just three weeks later. Welcome back. Over in Australia now, more than 1,400 dairy processing and warehouse workers at over a dozen sites across Victoria began a 48-hour strike, opposing company enterprise agreement offers that would further slash real wages. They make some of our favourite dairy products and they want more. Buy, buy, buy. And when do you want it? Yeah. Factory workers in Mulgrave joining 14,000 downing tools for better pay. It's happening because of the big multinationals absolutely refusing to move. We want strong regional communities and to get strong regional communities we need strong fair wages. The flow on expected to impact everyone's bottom line. What will be affected most acutely is small retailers. Workers are now on strike across 13 sites belonging to major producers Saputo, Fonterra, Lactalis and Peters. They'll be off the job for 48 hours. It comes as dairy transport workers also take industrial action. And the unions have targeted the industry at probably what is one of its most challenging periods in history. We've got soaring costs, particularly around raw milk. Both Fonterra and Lactalis say the companies are doing everything possible to ensure farmers don't have to dump milk. But without tankers to pick it up, thousands of litres has already gone down the drain. Other farmers are worried they may have to do the same. Dumping milk's definitely a concern. It, it adds time to our day. Um, there's environmental considerations. But workers and unions are not backing down. That will affect the price and the cost of living for consumers. The US House Speaker crisis drags on. Republican Representative Jim Jordan failed yet again to win the House Speaker's gavel in the second vote yesterday. He fared worse than he did during the first round on voting on Tuesday. Republican Jim Jordan has stumbled again in his bid for Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. The conservative firebrand and close Trump ally lost a second vote for the chamber's top job on Wednesday, faring even worse than he had in the first vote less than a day earlier. The tellers agree in their tallies that the total number of votes cast is 433, of which the Honorable Jim Jordan of the state of Ohio has received 199. No person having received a majority, the whole number of votes cast by surname, a speaker has not been elected. Between the two votes, Jordan lost the support of one Marionette Miller Meeks, who represents a politically competitive district in Iowa. Miller Meeks said she had received, quote, credible death threats after pulling her support from Jordan in the second vote. Republicans who control the chamber by a narrow nine-vote margin have been unable to unite behind a speaker candidate since the unprecedented ouster of Kevin McCarthy on October 3rd. The House has now entered its third week without a speaker, leaving Congress unable to respond to the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine or move to prevent a partial government shutdown, which will begin in a month without congressional action. That paralysis, along with Jordan's failure to secure the support needed to win the gavel, is pushing some Republicans to consider a backup option for the leaderless chamber, including expanding the powers of Representative Patrick McHenry, who is temporarily filling the Speaker's chair. Democrats, meanwhile, have seized on the infighting across the aisle to make the case for a compromise candidate, backed by both parties. 
though that option would mark a sharp departure from how Congress typically functions. Jordan told reporters he would not make another attempt at the chair until Thursday at the earliest, which would mark the third consecutive day of voting on his bid. Turkish company car power ship has restored power to Guinea-Bissau's capital after cutting off supplies over an unpaid bill of $15 million. Bissau had been plunged into darkness for nearly two days with hospitals affected and radio stations off air. The country is one of the poorest in the world and has been beset by instability since independence. Guinea-Bissau's capital was plunged into darkness on Tuesday after Turkish company car power ship cut off electricity supplies. The West African country's economy minister said that was due to an unpaid debt of 17 million US dollars. Suleiman Saidi added that arrangements were underway to pay 15 million dollars of arrears owed by the electricity and water company of Guinea-Bissau. He promised the issue would be resolved in 15 days. Our power ship is one of the world's largest operators of floating power plants. It has, according to its website, been providing 100% of Guinea-Bissau's electricity needs since 2019. A car power ship spokesperson said about the situation in Guinea-Bissau that its floating power plant was unable to continue operating following a protracted period of non-payment. A statement added that the company was working around the clock with officials to resolve the issue. It's not the first time car power ship has been involved in such a dispute. Last month, it switched off the electricity supply to Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown, due to an unpaid debt of around $40 million. Tesla CEO Elon Musk said that he was concerned about the impact of high interest rates on car buyers. He further added that the electric vehicle maker was hesitating on its plans for a factory in Mexico as it gauges the economic outlook. Elon Musk is sounding a warning over high interest rates. He says they risk making new cars unaffordable for consumers. Musk was speaking after the latest earnings numbers from Tesla on Wednesday. The EV maker saw third quarter revenue rise 9% to just over $23 billion. However, that fell short of analyst estimates and marked the slowest pace of growth in more than three years. The company has slashed prices this year in a bid to maintain demand. But Musk says the ultimate price paid by buyers hasn't actually changed much, once you factor in higher interest rates on finance. The price cuts have also battered Tesla's profit margins, which fell more than analysts expected. Looking ahead, Musk is getting cautious on expansion. He had planned a new factory in Mexico, but now says he's not sure about going full tilt on that move. Tesla's long-delayed Cybertruck also remains a problem. Musk said there would be enormous challenges in reaching profitable volume production for the radically styled pickup. Tesla shares sank over 4% in after-hours trade following the results and Musk's wary outlook. The stock has more than doubled this year as investors bet the firm can ride out any recession better than rivals but it's still some 40% off the peak seen in late 2021. Welcome back. An accused in a communal violence case in India has been sentenced to life in prison. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. A Bharatpur court has given life imprisonment sentence to the prime accused in a 2007 murder that triggered communal violence in the area. Prime accused Mohammed Shami, who remained absconding for 16 years after jumping bail, was arrested last month. Research scientists from the International Atomic Energy Agency visited a fish port near Fukushima nuclear power plant today to sample fish and sea water for the first time. Ukraine faces a second winter of lengthy power outages amid relentless Russian missile and drone attacks that have left parts of the energy system more vulnerable than a year ago. The US broadly eased sanctions on Venezuela's oil sector in response to a deal reached between the government and the opposition parties for 2024 elections. The US Secret Service and the San Francisco Police Department gave a briefing to discuss security plans for the upcoming Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leader Summit taking place in the city next month.
And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight in Milan, Italy, as checkerboards dominated Versace's catwalk at Milan Fashion Week, serving up the print on dresses and suits for women's wardrobes for next spring. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.